In this video, we solve problem 14.1.064 from the Larson and Edwards Calculus Early Transcendental Functions text, seventh edition. We're asked to sketch the region of integration and we're given this double integral. Then we're asked to evaluate the iterated integral and we're given this hint. It says, note that it is necessary there's a word missing, it is necessary, to switch the order of integration, round your answer to four decimal places. Okay, so let's start by writing down the integral. It's really an iterated integral. Now remember, these bounds will give you enough information to infer that region of integration. So the innermost bounds go with the innermost variable, and typically, and in our innermost variables, y, uh, typically we're thinking of this being associated with lower values of that var variable, excuse me, and this being associated with higher va values of that variable. So when we say that y goes from x to 3, we're usually saying that x is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 3. Now that can be flipped in some circumstances. Sometimes the inequalities might go the other way. Um, but most of the time that's the case. That's how it's traditionally done. And the outermost bounds go with the outermost variable. So this is saying that X starts at zero and ends at three. Now this is enough for us to sketch that region of integration. The way I tend to think of it is we've got, um, or I tend to think of it as us having, excuse me, um, four curves here. We have Y equals X, we have Y equals three, we have x equals zero and x equals three, and those are the boundaries of our region of integration. So I would start by sketching those. Y equals x looks like this. Y equals three is a horizontal line. X equals zero is the y axis, remember that and x equals three is a vertical line. Now, after sketching those four curves, um, some students may have trouble deciding uh, whether this is the region of integration or this is the region of integration, but these bounds over here will help you. This tells you that y starts at x and ends at three. So this is our bottom function and this is our top function. Since y is going from a function to a function, we might draw representative rectangles vertically and we want the bottom function to be x and the top function to be three. So our representative rectangle would look something like this. And that means that this region up here is our region of integration. So when it asks you to sketch that region of integration in WebAssign, you would just choose this. If you were taking a test or a quiz, um, you would just write this down and use these bounds to infer that we're talking about this region as opposed to this region. Now, if we're evaluating this iterated integral from here, typically the way it's done is that we start on the inside and we work our way out. Just using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we would take the antiderivative first, and then after anti-differentiating, substitute in y equals three and substitute in y equals x and subtract. Then you'll end up with a function of x that you can integrate from zero to three. But that's not possible this time. Notice that we've got e to the negative y squared and all of the methods that you've learned in calculus one and calculus two for computing this anti-derivative fail to work. Um, you can't use your basic rules. U substitution doesn't work. Integration by parts doesn't work. It actually turns out that there isn't a function that you can take the derivative of that will give you this e to the negative y squared back. So we have to do something else. We can't integrate with respect to y first and then x because we can't write down that first antiderivative of e to the negative y squared with respect to y. So we've got to do something else. Um, so rather than thinking of y as going from a function to a function and x is going from a constant to a constant as we do right here. And we're thinking of integrating this function of y um, over this triangle. Rather than thinking of it that way, we could always just switch the order of integration. Rather than letting y go from a function to a function and x go from a constant to a constant, we could let x go from a function to a function. 
a function on the left to the function on the right, while letting y go from a constant to a constant. If we draw our rectangles this way and think of integrating from this curve for x to this curve for x and letting y range from 0 to 3, um, perhaps we will be able to evaluate that antiderivative on the inside. And actually, I think we will. I, mean, I think it'll be just fine because this is constant with respect to x. So we're going to switch the order of integration. Rather than integrating with respect to y first and then x, we'll integrate with respect to x first and then y. And we want x to go from a function to a function. And we want y to go from a constant to a constant. Now the constant part is easy. y starts at zero and ends at three for this region. So we'll do that first. And then here, we want x to go from this bottom function or this left function to this right function. We always integrate from left to right, from the lower values of x to the higher values of x, and higher values of x are on the right. Well, x is equal to zero over here. And over here, um, x is equal to y. So I'm replacing, or I'm saying that x is this function of y, which is y there. Now, if this was y equals x squared, I would typically have to solve for x first, solve for x in terms of y, but since we're dealing with such a simple function, y equals x, um, it's, it's obvious that x is also equal to y. So x starts at zero and ends at y, going from a function of y to a function of y, and y starts at zero and ends at three. So those are our new bounds. And once we've switched those um, variables, once we've switched to integrate with respect to x first and then y, this antiderivative is really simple. We start on the inside and we work our way out and we say, well, what's the antiderivative of this with respect to x? Well, that doesn't have any x's in it. So it's just a constant with respect to x. The antiderivative of a constant with respect to x is that constant times x. And then by the fundamental theorem, we evaluate from x equals 0 to x equals y. So we anti-differentiate with respect to x, and we get this. And then we substitute in the upper limit, which is y. We get that. Then we substitute in the lower limit to give us a zero and we subtract. Of course, subtracting zero doesn't do anything. We just are left with that. And then we evaluate this integral. And then this one's pretty um, straightforward as well. Notice you've got a function inside the exponential function times a y. As soon as you see that product, you're probably thinking u substitution or integ integration by parts, right? Well, u substitution is the way we want to go with this one because the function inside the exponential function is that negative y squared. And if I take the derivative of that, I get negative 2y dy. Since I had a function nested inside another function, I thought u substitution might be a good way to go. So I decided to try it. I chose my u. I computed the du. Now remember, we, we are never really sure if the u substitution will work until we compute that du and then see if we can write everything up here entirely in terms of uh, the new variable u. Or in other words, once I compute du, I'm looking at this, I'm sort of ignoring the two because I can always adjust the constant by multiplying or dividing by a different constant. And I'm looking for a y dy. And I say to myself, if there is a y dy up here, then the u substitution will work. And there is a y dy. It's gonna work just fine. So I can take this equation and solve for y dy by multiplying both sides by negative one half. And I get that. And then this integral can be written entirely in terms of the new variable u. So this is e to the u. y dy is negative one half of du. And then we need bounds. 
we need uh, values for u here rather than values for y. This says that y starts at zero and ends at three. If I'm writing an integral in terms of u, I need to know where u starts and where u stops. So we'll just evaluate this expression at y equals zero and y equals three, and that will get us our new bounds. At zero, we get zero. At three, we get negative nine. And if you're one of those people that would prefer to have the negative number down here so that we go from a smaller number to a larger number, you can flip the limits of integration. That's fine as long as you multiply the integrand by negative one. So if you want to, you can call that positive one half times the integral from negative nine to zero of e to the u du. You don't have to do that, but you can if you're one of those folks that wants to go from a smaller number to a larger number. It's totally fine. Okay, and now we are almost done. Bring your one half down, take the antiderivative of e to the u, you get e to the u. Evaluate at u equals zero and u equals negative nine and subtract. So we'll have one half times e to the zero minus e to the negative nine, which gives us a one half times one minus e to the negative nine. And that is the value of our integral which is this, and you can think of it in this way if you want to. Of course, this is a cartoon because this function does not look like this. So if I've got z equals e to the negative y squared, it's not going to look anything like this, but imagine you've got this function. It's a function of two variables. As x and y change, uh, the z value is given by e to the negative y squared. And we're interested in sort of a net volume between that function and the xy plane above this uh, triangular region. So x goes from zero to three. And y goes from x to three. So this would have been that rectangle right there, but we're on the part of the rectangle that is up against the y axis. So what, what we're actually computing here is the volume under the surface given by e equals negative the, e to the negative y squared, which isn't, doesn't look anything like this, but we're looking at the volume under a surface above this little triangular region r in the xy plane. And if you wanna know what that volume is, that function is always positive. So it is a true volume and not a net volume. That volume is this one half uh, times the quantity one minus e to the negative ninth. 